Welcome back to Research Unpacked from the Informed Performance Podcast. My name is Dylan Carmody, and I'm a physical therapist and strength and conditioning coach from the U.S. On today's show, we have Tyler Yerby, and we'll be discussing his research around ecological dynamics. Follow along as we unpack his paper, Applying an Ecological Approach to Practice Design in American Football. Some case examples on best practice. Today's episode of the Informed Performance Podcast has been sponsored by Vald Performance, makers of the Nord Board. The Nord Board has become the gold standard for assessing field-based hamstring strength. By combining advanced sensors, real-time data visualizations, and cloud analytics, the Nord Board helps practitioners to accurately measure, monitor, and train individuals' hamstring strength or imbalances. To learn more about the Nord Board, visit our sponsor, volperformance.com. Informed Performance is a proud partner of HUMAC Norm by CSMI. By using the HUMAC Norm isokinetic system, you can see what you are treating. An isokinetic test measures maximum muscle capacity through range of motion. So when you're comparing an athlete's involved sides results to their uninvolved, this system makes it easy but objective to see where strength deficits exist to help you design a very efficient path to function. Then follow-up testing on the machine will confirm if your athlete or athletes are on the right path or if changes still need to be made. To learn more about the new HUMAC Norm and their refurbished machines, visit humacnorm.com. Informed Performance is proud to partner with Sportscientia, an emerging precision technology that harnesses the power of AI and machine learning to seamlessly capture gait analysis in real-world conditions and provide 3D depictions of the foot during both swing and stance phases of the gait cycle. This enables practitioners to further break down analysis of athletes running and moving in multi-directional movements, their forces, their max speeds, distances, steps, and more. To get more information, head to their website, sportsyenture.com. Tyler, how's it going, man? Doing fantastic. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, of course, man. I'm glad we could find a time to meet and uh, just sort of get things rolling with this sort of conversation. I'm really excited for today. Yeah, likewise. I Personally, this is going to be a fun one. This was actually my first published paper, um, so I, I'm pretty stoked to discuss this one, no doubt about it. And it happens to be an area that I'm pretty interested in, so it should be a good conversation. Heck yeah. Um, so just kicking things off, uh, for anyone who may not be familiar with who you are or um, you know what you guys do with Emergence, um, would you just mind sharing your current roles, responsibilities, and maybe a little bit in terms of like the path that you got to take there? Yeah, great question. I'm just a guy that likes movement, uh, likes helping people, loves to, ex- loves to explore myself. I have three little kids, and so I'm constantly learning and growing myself. But uh, on a more professional note, oh, let's see. I've been in the industry for nearly 20 years now. I've worn a lot of different hats, uh, still do, but I, I say I've worn a lot of different hats because I have had several different stops where I've been maybe more specifically a strength and conditioning coach or I was a running backs coach in college. Uh, in American football. I've done a lot of different things, but yeah, so Emergence is a sport movement skill education company, but we're actually leaning towards dropping the sport part of it because we are actually working a lot in the tactical space. We're working a lot um, with uh, military. Uh, I won't get into it too much, but let's say an emerging area. People are realizing that these ideas don't just underpin sport movement. They underpin, they underpin human movement. So that said, uh, it's a movement skill education company and the whole point of it is to help elucidate what ecological dynamics is, uh, what it can offer individuals that are keen to maybe utilize or harness some of the ideas. And we have been in business now for just shy of four years. And we work primarily in sports, but as I mentioned, working in, you know, with fire and rescue and uh, police and things of that nature has been pretty, pretty uh, interesting. And then as far as me in, in general, like I'm on the end stage of my doctoral research, I can see the finish line. And as you, uh, as you know, it's, it's a fun process, but it's also a tedious one. So that said, uh, I am excited about that. And then as far as the path, I mean, it started with me working as a football coach. I'll just, I'll just say that because this could take too long for me to outline the entire journey, but it started as a football coach and a strength and conditioning coach. I was working with football primarily, American football, strength conditioning, but also assisting occasionally with baseball and basketball. This was at Northeastern State, which is a pretty decent sized D2 in Northeastern Oklahoma. They got real cute with their name. Um, And then uh, I was a running backs coach and also worked with the punters and kickers as well. So that's where I started. I identify now as a sport 
or a sport or a skill acquisition specialist. You can you can term it how you want it. I prefer skill acquisition specialist because it's not just sport. And I think we'll get into the unpacking of what that actually means. So hopefully that's enough. I know that question can sometimes take a while. Oh no, I I love it. You know, sometimes people go on for like ten minutes, and it's you know it it started when I was born, and then from there, you know. Yeah, I wasn't gonna go back that far. That's why I went from like I was a position coach to you know emergence or back and forth. We'll we'll leave out the rest of it in between. I'm sure we'll touch on it a little bit as we go. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and it's super cool how you guys are like starting to get in more to the tactical space. I feel like a lot with ecological dynamics and all this kind of stuff. There's the idea of like complexity science within that and like tactics and those sorts of areas. And I think that, you know, whether it's, it's fire or whether it's a military or whether it's whatever, you know, um, the idea of like complex systems really comes to mind for me where it's very tactical. It's very emergent. Like nothing is controllable in those sorts of situations. Well, it's, I I completely agree. And it's really interesting. You mentioned that. And I want to give props to the individuals that have sought us out from that space because they were the, they were the, keen individuals that were like, hey, these ideas actually make a lot of sense and they make a lot of sense within our area and here's why. And they started talking about the importance of being able to to draw a weapon under pressure or being able to navigate through a space whenever it's not a perfectly controlled conditions if they're trying to rescue someone. I'm like, yep, I completely agree. So it's been a really fun journey. We're really just on the the start of that journey, but it's it's exciting nonetheless. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it seems super interesting. Um, Without getting too far off track, uh, we'll we'll narrow things down in terms of just like the paper that we were talking about yeah. today. Um, uh, before I guess we get into the nuances of the paper, can we just take a maybe ten thousand foot view and just talk about you know defining terms and like what is ecological dynamics? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's probably talked about too loosely sometimes, so I'll try to be concise. It's a transdisciplinary framework that borrows from other scientific disciplines to help understand skill, performance, and development. That's probably the easiest way to to unpack it. Um, Learning in ecological dynamics is considered to be ongoing. That's that's why it's really termed skill adaptation versus acquisition. Uh, Central to ecological dynamics are perceptions, cognition, action. And notice I didn't say and. They're, They're considered to be highly intertwined. And then so is the performer environment relationship. That's where we should be focusing our center of attention, focusing our analysis. And so the importance of an individual that's embedded in the environment in a larger space, uh, it's not necessarily what's inside their head. It's what their head's inside of. And that's to borrow from William Mace, um, the ecological psychologist. So it's a performer environment relationship. It is perception, cognition, action, but it's really just a transdisciplinary framework that can help us understand more about skill, performance, and development, us being anybody that's interested within sport or outside of sport. Yeah. No, I mean, I love that. I I like the, the nuance that you put there in terms of not saying, you know, perception and action or perception, cognition, and action or adding those sorts of things in just because um, I guess I, I kind of stealing this from a, a different framework from my view or my kind of world on healthcare and rehab, uh, there's this idea of the biopsychosocial lens, you know, and like um, a lot of times people will view those things almost um, as like three separate entities, you know, with maybe a little bit of overlap in the middle. And that's where like biopsychosocial comes into play, or that's where ecological dynamics comes into play with perception, cognition, action. Um, but so uh, a great anal- yeah, a great analogy that I had heard um, was, you know, it's almost like you take, three separate chunks of like play-doh right you know and they're all three different colors and it's the same thing as like biopsychosocial or perception cognition action you know um rather than thinking about them as like separate complete like entities you're thinking about like this mess of a like brown blob of play-doh where they're all mixed together (laughs) and they're all occurring at the same time because it's impossible to separate one from the other you know that's, that's a great analogy, and it's such an important idea, though, to ruminate about, I think, for anyone that's interested in just movement and learning, simply because, and I'll admit, for far too often, I, I kind of studied them independently, and then would try to put these pieces back together and wonder why my athletes were maybe performing despite me, but they weren't necessarily improving because of what I, in particular, was doing. So I think it is important to consider. 100%. Um, awesome. So... I kind of wanted to maybe touch on a little bit of, you had shared a video with me earlier this week, um, just talking about the concept of, you know, embracing what is. 
Um, can you just sort of talk a little bit more about that and maybe appreciate there or like touch on some of the underpinnings that that also has to do with sport and like, you know, the dynamic nature that we view sport in? Uh, 100%. Hopefully we have about three hours here because <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, because now we're going to get into actually another paper, which I won't touch on too much, but uh, referring to our being water papers where those ideas were inspired from. Uh, I, like Sean, am a huge fan of Bruce Lee and his works and everything that he's done and the the ideas that have carried on well beyond his death. And the notion of what is was described by Bruce as you're completely letting go of the past. You're not even considering what the future may hold and you're immersing and embracing now what is. And that's important because if we look at how those ideas can highlight talking about ecological dynamics, is it's highlighting the importance of the information that you're engaging with now. The information that specifies what opportunities for action are on the landscape, within the landscape for you. And I can get into more so what that means within American football here in a second, because I have a sneaky suspicion that's what we'll talk about. But you're embracing right now, you're trying to become sensitive and attuned, attuned being increasingly sensitive to your surroundings and engaged with and constantly coupled to your surroundings. And in doing so, you're more aware, I guess you can say, in some ways. And if we're talking about this within sport in particular, I can become more sensitive to specifying information, such as one's bearing angle or the relative velocity at which they're moving. Stuff that's going to be really important for me if I'm going to be able to shake a defender or if I'm going to be able to converge on a ball carrier. So what is would be now. What's present in the information available for pickup to be detected by our perceptual systems now. Amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's cool how you're able to tie that back to maybe you can call it more tangible aspects of sport, you know, talking about velocities or talking about change of direction or things like that. And appreciating the fact that these aren't these, you know, weird ethereal concepts that we just talk about in space, you know, these are actual like applicable ideas that we can utilize within sport. And I think that that's an interesting topic that sometimes people almost straw man the ecological dynamics approach of being like, well, you know, like they don't coach, you know, they just let people do their thing because everyone's every every movement is beautiful movement and everyone's their own little perfect butterfly, you know, <laughs> where in, you know, reality, like <laughs> uh, there are ways in which you coach and like as an ecological dynamics practitioner, like there's an argument to say that you coach more so than somebody else um, to a certain degree. Oh my gosh, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm going to utilize the what is concept right now for this explanation as well. When I was early in my coaching days, I mean, obviously I cared. I, I wanted my athletes to improve and I was invested in everything, but I also wasn't overly attuned or sensitive to what is. I wasn't, I was just, I was going from a script. I was, it was very authoritarian driven. Um, not that I wanted to be that way. It's just what I had grown up learning. And it was just, I was just going to be reciting what they needed to do. And if they didn't fit my model of movement, then they were wrong. And from an ecological perspective and specifically utilizing constraints and manipulating them purposefully, which is a CLA, you actually are more engaged and it's quite challenging because not everything you do is going to be perfect. I may manipulate a constraint or several constraints within a particular activity in order for those constraints to then act as information that then specifies affordances or opportunities for action. And those affordances are individual and frame dependent, meaning that what I perceive to be an affordance is very different than what my one-year-old son perceives to be an affordance. So I, I'm not going to get too far gone uh, before I make my final point, but I do want to revisit my son here in a second. But the reason why that's important is, is if I'm manipulating constraints and all of a sudden I'm seeing, uh, let's call it mistakes that are being made, there may be a need for that because the individual is working through the learning process to become sensitive and attuned. But I also may need to be aware to where I may need to manipulate another constraint. So you're actively engaged as a coach utilizing a constraints-led approach, which is underpinned by ecological dynamics and nonlinear pedagogy. But that's important because we do get this notion of it being, well, they're just hands-off. And and I, I'll, pardon me very quickly. I'll make this short, I promise. So I actually asked 
that question to my supervisor, who was partly, let's call it responsible for maybe that occurring, and that's Keith Davids. Uh, so one of the individuals that helped coin the term ecological dynamics back in 1994. I asked him that question at this year's Sport Movement Skill Conference of this past year, and he kind of like chuckled. He said, you know, I, I kind of am partly responsible for that. It was needed at that time, though, because at that time, it was it was so hands-on to be controlling that he wanted to have this stark contrast to kind of let it start to have some emergent nature to it. What he what he meant by it was that, not just stand back and let it whatever self-organize because self-organization can be functional and non-functional. So we don't have to get into that too much, but yes, going back to the original point, you have to be sensitive to what is as a coach as well, because it's that performer environment relationship. And that also involves the the coach in it. I couldn't agree more. And it, you know, the, the previous, almost the kind of like how you guys had touched on in the paper, the coach centered approach um, deems, you know, one individual as like the knower, you know, as the knower of movement, the knower of right and wrong, um, rather than letting, you know, the patterns that are, the athletes are trying to express or the individual interactions that are occurring during sport to actually come about and, you know, actually self-organize. Um, and it's interesting the way in you, in which you described it almost reminded me, it's like, it is, it is a complex system of complex systems, right? You know, you yourself are like the coaching dynamic is a complex system because you are seeing what is happening in the athlete and you are then iterating your process because of the, you know, constraints that you're applying and those sorts of variables within that. And I just think that that's a, it's another key point that sure, we're talking about movement and the emergence of movement. Um, but this is also like the emergence of coaching and how we interact with our, the people that we work with. That's exactly right. There's there have been many in this space, in the ecological space, that have talked about the importance of this like co-adaptive relationship. And like I mentioned, that involves the the coach or the teacher or whoever it may be. But the point is, is that and, and I want to go back real quick to you mentioned coach centered. Coach centered, and this is kind of a, a point of a contention for some because coach centered doesn't mean that Either they care more or they don't care at all or it's all about them. It just oftentimes is more about when you mentioned it earlier or alluded to it, like it's this, you're trying to get the athlete to adhere to one way of being and doing. And in doing so, you're prescribing a model of movements and then, you know, to take it a step further, then we're expecting that model of movement is probably stored somewhere in the brain as a representation that can be then pulled from whenever they see this perfect cue and that the environment's static. I mean, there's so many issues, unfortunately, with the one arrow approach. Um, and then also like, where are we storing all this? Scientists still don't know. Point being is, if it's even stored, point being is that with a coach-centered approach, it doesn't mean that that you're, if you would, if you are hearing that and you're like, well, that's kind of what I do. It doesn't mean you're a bad coach. It, it just means that maybe there's a way that you could tweak some of the interactions to make it more about the learner. And that's why learner-centered approaches come about. Uh, now, I will say, even within a learner-centered approach, it doesn't necessarily mean one's prioritizing the emergent interactions all the time. The whole notion of a learner-centered approach is that you are allowing for that co-adaptive relationship and you're allowing for maybe the the learner or the athlete, the performer, the uh, individual, the patient, the client to maybe be involved in the process, um, have dialogue that occurs. So, the whole idea is a learner-centered approach would would be underpinned by ecological dynamics, which is what I described at the onset here, which would prioritize that performer-environment relationship and appreciate the fact that learning from an ecological dynamics perspective is an active process, to borrow from J.J. Gibson. 100%. Yeah, it's um, it's funny. It's like that that dynamic relationship between, I guess you can call it the learner and the coach, or um, you know, the the practitioner and the individual. Um, I I'll steal this from a, a quasi mentor of mine. His name's Paul Erickson, but he had he had mentioned a uh, way in which he involves like shared decision making into his practice as a physical therapist, and um, he described it as you know two experts coming together, right? You know, I like. like 
yeah, as, a, like as a coach, you have your expertise, right? Um, but the individual in front of you is an expert in themselves, you know, That's true. and you guys are trying to solve a, a problem together. Um, and it's going to take both expertise of both individuals in order to come and solve that problem, whether that be a movement related problem, a pain related problem, anything else. It's the concept of having both people having skin in the game so that there's some type of outcome that is, you know, more optimal than not. It's exactly right. I think when we talk about the movement problem solving process, it is going to involve more than just one individual. It's going to involve more than just an individual separated from their environment. It needs to be appreciated together as a collective whole. So I couldn't agree with that more. 100%. Um, so getting back a little bit towards the paper itself, mm -hmm. um, I personally, like selfishly, am a very big fan of like nomenclature and understanding words and like the meaning mm -hmm. behind that. Um, that Love that. Uh, why do you think it's important that we use terms like a movement problem, a movement solution, you know, dexterity and attunement or, um, you know, those sorts of concepts and those sorts of words when we're talking about movement? You know, why can't we just say coordination? You know, why can't we say something like that? You know, I'll answer it in two ways. And this is something I'm highly passionate about. So I do not apologize to the listeners if this offends you. <laughs> um, no, I do care, but I, but I also don't apologize. I care, but I don't apologize. Language is powerful. Language has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it has helped societies and cultures operate functionally. Um, it, it also is something that can limit or reduce the time that's needed in order to convey a point or an idea to help someone maybe move more skillfully, if we're talking about it specifically within sport. And, and that could be like real simple, real quick communication points with an athlete whenever you're working with them, like in my setting, uh, such as in, I, I actually took this from uh, Sean Mishka, and when he was like, he, he would just say, he would look at an athlete and go, 360. That's all you would say to him. Well, he'd had conversations with him prior. And what that meant was engage with your surroundings around you. It's not just what's in front of you. It could be what's behind you. It could be what's in your periphery. So something as simple as that. Or if I'm in a conversation and I talk about movement problem solving, well, what I mean by movement problem solving is, is there's a confluence of constraints at any moment in time that are shaping the emergence of affordances. And the emergence of affordances, there's not just there's generally not just one affordance that's emerging on a landscape. There's multiple. And if that's the case, well, I need to be able to convey those ideas if I'm having a conversation with someone or if I'm talking to my athlete in a relatively succinct way that's meaningful. So language is powerful. Now, I will say on the back end of that, there are there is a time and a place where coordination may, may be easier for some to grapple with than another term. Right. And, you know, a perfect example would be I'm, I'm co-authoring a paper right now that's going to be, let's just say, largely for decision makers um, in, in order for a particular position to start popping up or emerging within all sports. And we actually, funny enough, went in the direction of utilizing coordination in one setting versus functional movement solution. Uh, because one is coordinating, but also controlling potentially a functional movement solution that was organized to meet the demands of a problem. So I'll wrap all this up by saying, I think language is powerful. And the excuse that's made often is, well, the, the term was too large. And I'm like, you just told me that your athlete or your client is over pronating and they're having a valgus collapse at their knee, and it could be because of their cue angle within their hip, but you're telling me that degeneracy was too hard to unpack? It's like, come on. You know, like we, we have to be honest with ourselves that every niche has its own language that allows for it to function well. But I will end by saying I think the best teachers, if you will, especially from a practitioner standpoint, can operate within a setting and subtly start dropping some of the language. And shockingly, the athletes know exactly what it means because they're immersed within that movement problem solving. So when I say become sensitive to what is, my athletes don't go, I don't understand what you're talking about. Because we just utilize that language in relation to two converging defenders and then them seeing the potential for three or four affordances or opportunities for action, such as bouncing the ball wide, splitting the defenders, cutting back across them, or running them over. Those are affordances and each one's frame and independent based on the individual. 100%. Um, yeah. Again, 
I, I just, I'm a big fan in terms of how you're able to tie some of these things back into like the, the tactical of, of sport, you know, and uh, understanding those sorts of things. Cause that's, that's how coaches as a whole should be understanding these things. You know, um, it's myself included. I, I had, tend to have a hard time integrating, you know, um, we have these concepts and then we integrate them into practice. Right. Um, and it is a, it's a difficult task, um, it especially as like a, a, a fresh coach or as a, as a new practitioner or something like that. It, you have a lot that is kind of on the forefront of your brain, you know, a lot of, a lot of conscious effort, you know, and it's, it's, that's, that's true. I will say this, Dylan, I apologize for jumping in. I just, I want to make this point. Like, obviously I'm, it may sound harsh where I'm like, you need to understand the language and it's true, but I'm not saying that I'm not here to try to help be part of a team, a much, 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 much larger team that helps the learning curve be a little bit softer. So oddly enough, and I referenced it already, our being water paper, which you can link in the show notes if you want to. We actually, part of the impetus for the the writing of that paper was centered around like, how can we make these ideas more accessible? Um, and this isn't to knock Keith and, and Duarte and all these other brilliant scientists that have researchers that have come before us, uh, but it's like, how can we make this more accessible? And Bruce Lee did such an incredible job of capturing like, complexity of ideas and like a, a unique quote such as using no way is way. Well, using no way is way is meaning to be adaptable in situations and finding, you know, he uses the idea of being water, you know, water can flow, water can crash, be water, my friend. Well, water can fit into cracks. Water can expand and crack a rock. Water can seep through and flow out the other side. Water can also crash and go over it. Well, what is that talking about? Adaptability. And so I think that the ideas that he conveyed, and I used the term highlight earlier, I think they highlight well the ecological dynamics ideas to hopefully make them more accessible. Because at the end of the day, the last thing I want, and this is something that we were battling more so, but not as much anymore. Like the, the language is so new because some books that I have on my shelf over here that came out, you know, years, a decade ago, like it wasn't overly practically driven. And so there weren't examples to elucidate what they may mean. And I think that was really one of the reasons why emergence started because I, you know, wrestled, wrestled, wrestled as did other individuals in the company with these ideas for a long time and made plenty of mistakes applying them. But in doing so, I learned more about it, and I'm hopefully able to create a a seeing glass for coaches to understand how to apply the ideas more fruitfully. Totally, yeah. Integrating both the the conceptual with the the I don't know the tangible. Um, but one thing, just so that we can stay more, I guess, on track, you call it. But um, when we're talking about you know creating an ecological dynamics framework, you know, we're we're trying to design movement in that way. Um, as, as a coach with, you know, like you said, over 20 years of experience, you know, let's say we have a um, evidence for some type of movement being either inefficient, suboptimal, however you deem that. Um, what is your process like or how are you going about designing a drill or a program um, to bring about movement that is a little bit, quote unquote, better for that individual? Um, maybe if we can like dive into an example or something like that would be helpful. Let's do that. Let's do that. So first thing I will do, let's just use football since that's really the, the origin of this conversation with the American football paper. So it's, it's using a SWOT analysis on the player or players you're working with. So I'm either engaging by watching them in person if I have an opportunity to do that. So like, for example, the second case example was about high school players and those high school players are in this area, this area being Minnesota where I'm located. So I had an opportunity to watch them in person, not a tremendous amount, but in person, I had an opportunity to start working with them early on whenever I really wasn't able to apply something that was specific for them because I was still learning about their movement capabilities. But then I was able to watch a lot of film on them. So why that's important, those ideas, whether it's in person, you working with them, whether it's observing them while they're playing on a team or whether it is through video analysis, is you can understand what they seemingly are doing well, even if it's subtly different and well being like what's solving a majority of the problems that they're facing. So that problem might be 
tackling more ball carriers, sacking the quarterback more often, uh, you know, yards after contact, catches in tight spaces. Like you can kind of see how that there's certain elements that you're evaluating. So I might look at a receiver of mine and go, great, he has a tremendous amount of yardage this year. But whenever I start analyzing his film, a weakness or let's call it area of opportunity of his is that he actually has a relatively low yard after catch number. So he's catching a lot of balls, which may mean he has a really good release. Maybe he has um, a good attunement with his quarterback and they're they're on uh, the same page to use the terms that are used in football. But yet whenever he catches it, he's not overly sensitive in his periphery. Maybe he's not coupling that with his with the auditory information he's picking up or potentially haptic information that he has because he's got a body on his back. And so the activities that are that are designed are a number of different things, but they're largely oriented towards him having to have a lot of goes at catching the ball in tight spaces where there's potentially perturbations from uh, an outstretched arm of a linebacker. So we actually might have a number of bodies kind of move in front of him and they're instructed to try to, to get in the way of distract him from being able to catch the ball. The quarterback's not just standing, standing back there nice and pretty either, throwing this perfect ball. They may actually have someone that's pursuing them or maybe not pursuing them from different angles to have a more game-like feel so you're not having this perfect ball that's released every time. And then that receiver has a defender or maybe multiple defenders, and the coach is there to manipulate maybe the starting interpersonal distances or maybe manipulate where that defender, are you underneath, are you over top, are you side by side, where is that individual struggling more? And then they're getting a lot of goes at having to catch the ball in that position or in a similar position to what you've identified or collectively identified as a weakness of theirs. And then their goal is to see how they can look for more yardage after that. And I literally mean like pun intended, look for, listen for, feel for, how can you be creative in this situation? Now it goes a step further than that. It's not, I mean, that's a lot of coaching there that I think goes unnoticed because you're designing an environment where affordances may emerge that are similar to the ones that he needs to interact with or she needs to interact with. And so I say all of that because After that, it might be, and this isn't even necessarily hypothetical because I've had to do this before, in a number of settings, the coach may have identified that so-and-so is seemingly rejecting an affordance on the boundary. It looks as though there's a lot of green space to curl back. So let's say it's a deep comeback route. So comeback route, let's just say it's a 20-yard comeback. So Receiver on the outside runs 20 yards and then boop, they curl around, come back towards the sideline a little bit. Generally at that point, if it's a successful completion, coach is fantastic. They don't, they don't really even care what happens after that. But all of a sudden the, we've identified that there's a lot of green space, a lot of times to actually catch that ball, exploit that defensive backs positioning on him, which may be shaded a little bit towards the sideline and curl back towards the inside. But so-and-so keeps rejecting that. Why is that? Well, maybe someone hasn't even illuminated what is for them. So it might be as simple as a question. Hey, you know, out of curiosity, Drew, question for you. What are you, what are you noticing about the individual whenever you're catching those deep comeback routes? A lot of times, what are you, what are you feeling from that defensive back? Well, coach, I wasn't feeling anything. I heard him coming and I thought I was in a position where I just needed to catch it and go out of bounds. Are on this next couple of routes, I just want you to try to be heightened to maybe what you feel and what you can see in here that may open up different possibilities. So I'm not telling them how to behave. I'm helping educate their attention and intention so they potentially can look for it and find it in that situation. Now, it goes beyond just that, but that should offer you an example of an actual activity design from the analysis of the video that had been identified as a weakness for them. And then potentially how I may change the interpersonal starting distance because I've found that Drew really struggles whenever he has someone underneath him. Well, guess what? I might have him underneath, but I might have him underneath and tell that defender, I want you to move at like an 80%, 90% ownership speed here. Why? Well, because I want that defender to be challenging to him, but I want there to be some level of success so Drew can become sensitive to that interpersonal distance, the velocity at which they're moving. And then at the very end, it may be educating their attention and intention 
to an affordance that I had perceived to see if they perceived the same affordance. Mm. Yeah. And, and there, there's so many things in there that like we could unpack, but I mean, just a couple, like there's the, the classics of like the, the Bayesian thought process of constantly updating, you know, what you are doing with what you are seeing and the information and the data that's coming in. Um, and just like understanding, you know, the, the fact that the learner is having to constantly update the ideas that they have or the, the movements that are emerging based on the things that they are becoming more and more attuned to. And I think that it, it lends itself very well to like this idea, like you're asking what people would call, I guess, very like ecologically valid questions, you know, um, can you maybe unpack like what somebody would mean by like the difference between just like an ecologically valid question versus something that would be a little bit overly direct or something like that? Yeah, I definitely will. Before I do, I, I will say I, I personally wouldn't view it as updating. I wouldn't say someone's updating a memory bank somewhere. I would say they're becoming progressively attuned to information. They're coming becoming more sensitive. And the reason why I say that, so if we use that same football example, let's say they've worked with me or someone that applies a constraints-led approach and an ecological approach for mo- like two months, and they've become sensitive to all these moving bodies. And all of a sudden, they go to your traditional football drill of catching it in an unopposed environment, maybe at varying speeds, perfect throw from the quarterback. They're not able to become sensitive to that information. So then when they get out on the field, they get jammed at the line or a perfect example. And I won't even, I won't highlight the team. There was a, there were, it was a team that was, it was a, a video that was shared on Twitter and it was this little funnel drill. I'm sure they called to where, the receiver caught it. They actually at least had a, an opposing body there. And the defensive back had to come in and try to work at a good angle. Well, this defensive back literally completely whiffed on what was seemingly a pretty easy wrap-up. But I would suspect that he hasn't had a lot of opportunities at becoming sensitive to that information, such as posture-related affordances or how sharp someone may be cutting. So my point being is that I think it's... That's why I said learning is is ongoing, um, which I wouldn't say that you would disagree with by any means because you you just use the term updated. So I just wanted to clarify that part from like my perspective. Um, as far as the – you asked specifically about uh, ecologically valid questions. That's a really good question. It's not expecting someone to answer you verbally and that be the answer. It's their actions answering you. That makes it ecologically valid more so. That's not to say that they can't answer you and that becomes part of the discussion. But when I say what have you, so let's uh, use a different example here. So, and I think I may have used this example on that short video that I sent to you. So I'll use this one again. If I am working with a defensive back and the defensive back is struggling on deep routes because they're maybe not picking up the extremities of the receiver. They're not picking up the eyes of the receiver and they're in lockstep with this guy running a deep go route. And I'm running a deep go route with this receiver. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm getting, I'm not breaking up any passes. I'm, I'm letting all these passes be completed. I might say something like, what have you noticed about their arms, the upper extremities and eyes whenever you guys are deep into that route? I, I didn't, I don't need them to answer me necessarily. Because all I'm really wanting is them to go, hmm, I've sparked curiosity. Now I need to go and start paying attention to it. Now they, I, a lot of times will start seeing guys right away, start to defend more passes because what they weren't seeing is they weren't seeing huge, big white eyes, or they weren't seeing quick hands to the ball. Well, that tells you that's specifying information that tells you a lot about what affordances are emerging from you. Now I can actually raise my arm to try to defend the pass or I need to keep running because I'm losing separation between the receiver. So it may go a step further than that, though. They may say, oh, I've noticed that, you know, their arms are starting to be quick to the ball. And I might say, bingo, I noticed the same thing. So really start to search for those quick extremities moving towards the ball. Conversely, if I'm working with that receiver and I'm seeing them have a lot of pass breakups, I might say, have you thought about trying to be late to the ball on catches versus early to the ball so as not to give away specifying information? I would say important information. So the whole point is is that a question that's ecologically valid to use the term 
would be more centered around their actions answering you. One additional one, and I actually have had this conversation with a, a friend of mine. We talked about something similar because we were both using it. Um, he's mainly a researcher, and I'm a pracademic, if you will. But we're, I've worked a lot with youth, and it to help youth explore how they can move because you want to talk about changing constraints. You know, one of the three constraints in discussion would be individual constraints. Well, some youth that's growing rapidly, they have different affordances. It's like changing second to second. All right, because of their growth. I might say, hey, Johnny, show me how you can move over that box differently every single time. So it might be literally like just like a soft plyo box and there's a crash mat on the backside. He might go and scoot over it. I might say, oh, that's awesome. Show me how you can get over it differently the next time. Or it might say, hey, what have you, no- have you noticed about the ability to potentially jump off of it? I'm not telling him how he has to, how he has to orient himself. I'm just trying to spark exploration. So the whole idea of it being a valid question from an ecological standpoint is to is to fuel the fire of curiosity for learning and exploring. Mm. Tyler, a lot of these concepts that we're talking about, they, it seems to have a lot of interplay and you know relationships to other. I guess you call it concepts or other ways in which um, individuals have like gone about being a practitioner or being a coach or a rehab provider. Um, you know, just even here from like asking, you know, better questions, you know, um, earlier on, we were just talking about how like the, the emergence itself of movement um, as well as just, you know, appreciating the, the complex systems that are always at play within um, the dynamics that we're interacting with the individuals in front of us. Um, I, I always like bringing the example of um, this idea of like what's called the pain neuroscience education. Um, for a while, it's a, it was a concept to me where um, it was a intervention, right? I pain neuroscience educated somebody on something, right? Um, it was a, yeah. And so it was this idea of, um, you know, it is this thing that I do um, with somebody or to somebody rather than, hey, this is just what our best evidence points to when it comes to pain. And this is how I can best educate this individual. Um, Hopefully trying to, I guess, wrap things up, not take away too much of your time. But um, I guess a a good closing question would be, you know, is, is ecological dynamics a thing? Is this something that we do to people? That's such a great question, man. That's such a great question. I kind of saw where you're going when you started unpacking your answer, because you actually, you said something earlier that answered your own question, which was awesome. And maybe it was on purpose. I'm not sure, but it's not, it's not a, I mean, in my humble opinion, it's not a, I ecological dynamics them (laughs) necessarily. I may have utilized a constraints led approach, but I view ecological dynamics personally as a worldview. It's underpinned by ecological psychology, dynamical systems theory, the complexity sciences, anthropology. I mean, there's a lot of things that underpin ecological dynamics, and you've mentioned the idea of of complex systems a number of times, which are central to ecological dynamics, which I absolutely love, and that constant interplay and everything being intertwined. So I don't think that I, I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily ecological dynamics to them in this situation, maybe didn't in another. I think that number one, constraints are always at play, whether coaches know that they're manipulating them or not. Uh, because constraints, which we won't exhaust here, you can read the paper. We we certainly talk about the importance of them. We offer examples uh, specifically to American football, but individual constraints, which can be height, weight, body fat percentage. It can be f- fatigue levels, environmental constraints. That can be ambient light available. It can be altitude. It can be the wind. It can be a number of different surface, be a number of different things, which also can sometimes serve as a task constraint if, if you put a turf field down. But anyways, and then there are task constraints, uh, which would be like rules in a setting, communication from a coach, things of that nature. Well, those don't just sometimes operate and sometimes don't. Like they're, they're always operating. Now, whether someone's purposefully manipulating them is a different question to try to draw out certain behavior that might be deemed to be more functional to help solve more problems. That's one thing. So I don't think ecological dynamics is necessarily a thing because I don't see it to be independent from the world that we know it or the world as we know it. 
Um, and then, you know, you can get into direct perception, indirect perception. You can start to get in stuff that's more of a philosophical rabbit hole, but is certainly powerful and meaningful. So I think in my humble opinion, and there's a lot of discourse that goes back and forth between sides, uh, you know, tremendous amounts. And I think at the end of the day, we're all after the same thing. I just, in my humble opinion, think that people are using constraints and manipulating them more than they realize that they are, but they're trying to mix in this authoritarian driven model, whether they've acknowledged that's the case or not. And then the other main thing that I see to be something that's kind of forced is, and this is partly answering your question, there are so many you, you, we, we both talk about strength and conditioning coaches. Strength and conditioning coaches care probably more, if, if not the most out of all, all professions. Like they care so much sometimes to the point where I'm like, it's they're, the drill that you just did with them or what you've been doing is so isolated that it maybe improved their acceleration capabilities. But then they go into camp and they look slow as can be. Well, they look slow because we only worked on their motor system capabilities. They haven't seen a moving body or had to make decisions all off season. So my point is, is that it can be done more effectively, it being applied more effectively versus not applied. But one has to see the world through a complexity lens, I think, first. And one has to appreciate a performer environment relationship versus viewing them to be independent. Uh, because skills don't operate in vacuums. One hundred percent. Yeah, I I think you you answered that perfectly, and I think it's it's easy too, just because that we we have a a variety of listeners. Some of them strength coaches, some of them rehab providers, some of them sports scientists. Um, and personally, you know, from a rehab provider standpoint, sometimes like there are very very specific. Uh, individual constraints, right? You take something like an ACL rehab, uh, ACL rehab, you know, like that, if that person can't produce enough force out of their quadricep, it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, what's going to happen. Like their movement is not going to be able to, you know, there's no environment that's going to bring out that kind of a movement. And so for some individuals, right, they're going to have to stay constrained and make sure that they apply a lot of different task constraints to an individual so that they can produce the movement that is necessary. Um, in order for like the stimulus to be and like the load to be applied in a certain, you know, tissue structure, whatever you may have it. Um, over time now from a rehab provider standpoint, we can kind of sit back and say, well, you know, when it comes to skill and when it comes to those sorts of things, like that's not quote unquote, our job, you know, our job is to get them, you know, physically prepared, you know, to produce those like biomotor qualities that they now possess. So that once that, um, environment or those movement patterns emerge, then they are capable from a motor production standpoint. Um, maybe would you have any recommendations for rehab providers that have that perspective um, in terms of how they could integrate some of those sorts of ecological dynamics tactics within the maybe middle or late stages of a rehabilitation? Yeah, plan? That's, that's a great question. And I'm glad that you brought up the different audiences because number one, physical therapists, a lot in the sports medicine space have been not just recently, but have been adopting these ideas some sooner, you know, than others. And then they've been around in different parts of the world, maybe, and used more so than other areas. But I say that simply because it, it doesn't, it transcends sport coaches or strength and conditioning coaches. And I hope, I hope that was implied whenever I said it's a worldview in my humble opinion, but I think it's important for physical therapists in particular or athletic trainers, because I know they're part of the return to play process sometimes as well. I, I, I want this next comment to, to not sound as though it's coming at physical therapists, or athletic trainers, because I'll raise my hand and say, I was just as much part of the problem when I was a strength coach at the universities that I was at. I think we always are like, well, that's not really my job or up oh, that I, that's not my lane. Well, that's fantastic. But there's a lot of lanes no one's driving in. So that's an issue. And it actually has inspired a talk that I delivered back in 2019 at the Sport Movement Skill Conference, which I've talked about tirelessly on different podcasts is like, like looking at it as a bridge analogy, the sport being a, the other side, the right side of the bridge, right? And they need to do well over here for them to make money and be able to provide for their family or them to be on the fields to earn a scholarship or whatever it may be. Okay. They need to, they need to do well over here. The other side of the bridge might be the entire support staff, which would be everyone else. 
right? And the position coaches are over here helping them try to be good at their role. Well, we might need to get them to the point to where, okay, great. I'm looking at my pretty clipboard and going, up, he has proper joint flexion here. Up, he dampened the impact force is great. Up, he has less than he has less than 10% difference from his other leg with his rate of force development. That's fantastic. Up, he's signed off and ready to go. I think we're missing the boat tremendously there. Now, where can we, how, how do we move them further along that bridge? Number one, we have to work together, actually work together. And we can't act as though like we have, we being one, one area have all the answers and another doesn't. And I think far too often teams would say that, oh, we worked, we work exceptionally well together, but you've got so many egos because you have people that thinks they should be in charge of the final write-off. I think the thing that we can do to answer your question now more specifically in the middle and late stages, and this is where it gets a little dicey and some people will get all nervous about this because they may lose their jobs. This is where you have to have the decision maker, let's call it the athletic director, head coach, whoever it may be, be involved in this process. How are we starting to design slices of the sport to where they can work through that process of solving movement problems so they can become sensitive and attuned to information? If they don't see it until they're now with it strapped up with a helmet on, pads on, and they have to tackle someone. So it can be as simple off for one example, because I'm really hoping that these ideas become popular enough to where I can cherry pick the position I'd like to work in, um, you know, with, with said, with said team and they are coming. Um, point being is that how can we bridge that gap? One way can be, I want you all, it could be a defender, the, a person, whether it's the coach, the this, uh, the therapist, whoever it may be, to work as a defender that's moving at fifty, roughly 50% speed at different angles for different amounts of velocity. And the individual that blew their ACL that's now recovered enough that's checked those boxes that we talked about, but we can't release them to play yet because they haven't been able to show confidence and ability to cut off of that. And I don't mean in an independent environment from individuals because behavior affords behavior. JJ Gibson talked about that a long time ago. The way you move is going to influence the way I move and vice versa. Well, if I, I'm not going to juke a cone, okay. And feel all pretty about it and be able to go and play. So I guess what I'm saying is, is having uh, a therapist or another defender move at relatively slow speeds. And I, I as am, am in this individual that blew my ACL in a really controlled, let's call it controlled environment. I'm trying to be evasive but I'm working through my confidence in cutting off of that damaged leg, the impact that I'm actually having to dampen, okay, the sensitivity I have through my mechanoreceptors and how I'm how I'm actually able to organize my movement effectively, but I'm coupling it to maybe the posture-related uh, kinematics of an individual. I'm coupling it to the velocity that they were moving. Maybe I start to add more complexity by adding another individual. You can kind of see where I'm going. Now, the challenge here is having someone that is comfortable enough to start to embed them in those environments without fear of, I'm going to lose my job. But are we doing that athlete a service by not doing it? And I think it takes some individuals that are willing to maybe be a little bit more, not risky with their health, but actually helpful to their well-being and their ability at a later date. And I think that comes from a collective agreement with a team. And I think that's where like an actual interdepartmental team would work the best together. And I think that it's starting to happen. I will say, I'll close with saying, uh, because I know we've been going for a while here. I think it's starting to happen because, I mean, you're you're a physical therapist by trade that also works in performance. I have a master's degree in kinesiology and I'm nearly finished with my doctorate in sport and exercise with an emphasis in skill adaptation acquisition. You can, you can call it what you want and coach development but we're having a conversation together. I know you're far more intelligent than I am in the return to play, making sure that maybe some of those individual constraints are less limiting, but we have to work together in order for me to help collectively us collectively be that powerful team to design an environment with an athlete. That way they can be the most skillful. 100%. You know, like we were talking about earlier, two experts coming together to try and solve a problem. (laughs) <laughs> um all right tyler wrapping things up um you kind of know the audience that we have in terms of clinicians coaches atc sports scientists all all surrounding kind of the interest in um sports performance sports science all those sorts of things um as a now official guest on the podcast um who comes to mind as another researcher that we should have on next oh man there's so many 
uh, kind of depends on, I know your audience from what you, what you described it to be. I mean, one that came to mind, I'll probably offer you two. I'll be the guy that offers you two rather than one. So a good friend of mine, a good mate of mine is Carl Woods, Dr. Carl Woods. He is exceptionally intriguing to listen to because he's not going to offer, although he is capable, he's not going to offer you nearly as many practical examples, but he's going to make you think. And in doing so, I think you'll continue to see the world differently. Uh, He's out of Victoria University. Uh, He's been in the field for a long time. He is younger than I am, but he's been a doctor a lot longer. <laughs> um, I would say Dr. Carl Woods would be awesome. He, he, he in particular has some fascinating papers that discuss wayfinding and the importance of moving through uh, your surrounds versus traveling across them. Uh, he draws heavily on anthropology and people like Tim Ingold. I would say either him or... Let me give you a, a really heavy, practically oriented individual. I mean, one that gives really great practical examples and can kind of draw from numerous sides. He has his own podcast, uh, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to, to join yours. And he's he's a really sharp individual, and he's funny. Uh, you probably know of him, Stuart Armstrong. Have you mm. are you familiar with Stuart Armstrong? Recognize the name for sure. I, I can't pin a face to it, but I, I'm yeah. familiar. He hosts the Talent Equation podcast. It's been around for, it's actually one of the, that one and Dr. Rob Gray with Perception Action podcast. Those two were probably the two that I listened to on repeat for the first, I'd been utilizing the ideas for maybe two years. And then I came across those two, those two podcasts and I've been listening to them now for about six, seven years. So I could offer so many different examples, but I wanted to give you someone in stark contrast uh, to Dr. Carl Woods, and I think Stuart Armstrong will fit that bill. He'll make it highly practical. He'll give you a lot of analogies as well, and uh, he is they're both in completely different uh, regions of the world, which I think is important too because there's different social cultural constraints that will shape the way they all package certain things. So Stuart being in the UK, in England in particular, and then Carl being in Australia. Hmm. I love that. Tyler, thank you so much for one coming on for those recommendations, all of the knowledge that you're sharing with um, myself and everybody listening. But um, I can't thank you enough. Um, In order for us to kind of wrap things up, I just want to hear, you know, where can people connect with you, learn more about what you and Emergence are doing, um, and maybe just support your work even more. Yeah, I appreciate that. We just recently released a paper um, about two months ago called reconceptualizing movement behavior in sport as a problem solving activity. Uh, It's open access. It's on frontiers in sports and active living. So I would say certainly look at that. Um, Maybe you could pen that in the show notes as well. We have a couple of other papers, of course, being water and has a longer title. And of course, American football paper would, I would say, engage with those. Uh, Two of those are open access. So it's, we, we paid for you to have access to it. So definitely do that. And then uh, emergences, we wish we had emergence.com, but there was a TV show coming out. I think it was NBC right whenever we were coming out and they had purchased the domain name. So we had to go with emergent, mvmt.com. So emergent, mvmt, movement.com. We have a lot of uh, recorded courses. We do have a university-like experience called the Movement Academy. Uh, check out our stuff on there. We have really low-hanging fruit to show you how to apply the ideas or how they could potentially be applied because uh, it's not all the answers. We we actually want to spark curiosity. And then we have a, a free blog post um, series or blog series that we offer on there where we post rather frequently. And then not to distract you in too many different areas, but we do have a Patreon called The Exchange, uh, which is really low hanging fruit. And we record five minute, 10 minute videos. Sean and I go on there and just pick a topic and discuss it for 20, 25 minutes. Uh, we write blog posts for that as well. that are a little bit more exclusive. So that's called The Exchange powered by Emergence. And that's on Patreon. I'd say those areas. And then of course, um, on social media, we're the most active on Twitter, which I think is now called X. I think uh, Twitter is now X. Um, I think that's correct, Elon. I'm sure you won't hear this. There's, but... there's, there's too many, yeah, <laughs> too many social media outlets these days. Uh, and, it's, and Instagram. So uh, Twitter and Instagram are X and Instagram, and it's at Emergent Movement. So the same thing as our our um, URL, or it's at Tyler Yerby to find me. I appreciate you having me on, Dylan. This has been a blast. Awesome, Tyler. Thank you so much once again for coming on, and uh, hope to keep in touch in the future. Yeah, likewise.